Good morning to everyone. Thank you for um, joining us for our very first VIP Listen It and Learn. Um, I'm really, really excited about this event um, as it's going to bring um, some really great information to our audience um, who will have the opportunity to learn from experienced um, entrepreneurs and um, industry leaders. So this morning we have um, Mr. William Randolph and we're really excited to have him. Thank you so much, Mr. Randolph, for agreeing to join us today. Um, and I'm gonna just let you take things over and um, introduce yourself and, and let us know where we're going today. So here's to you. Great. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity coming from the uh, Norfolk State University Innovation Center. And I am hoping that the next hour uh, sheds a little light on a topic that may be new to some of you, uh, but uh, I'm hoping won't be new to you for long. And that is uh, government contracting and particularly cracking the code to success. My name is William Randolph. I am the founder and CEO of a firm consulting firm called Think Acquisition. Uh, I created, created this company about two years ago, year and a half to two years ago, and I am honored to speak with you. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, the way the morning should run is I have about 40 minutes of content that I'd like to share, and then I want to make sure uh, there's time for question and answer at the end so that if there's anything that sparked uh, a question or comment or thought that we have open time at the end to make sure that that happens. So uh, with that, we're gonna get started. Uh, again, my name is William Randolph and this is Cracking the Code to Government Contracting Success. So who's this guy? I wanna make sure that you have a sense of why I, I think this hour uh, and as a, as a quote unquote VIP, why this hour is of value. I wanted, to sh I wanted to show just a chronological order of my career since I left the Department of the Navy as a enlisted guy in the Navy in 1993. Uh, I started in federal government in 1995 after I got out of the, after I got out of uh, the Navy with GI Bill in hand. I, I went to school, graduated, uh, and, and actually took some courses at uh, Norfolk State because I was. I was in the area as an enlisted guy back in the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s. But I want to just give you a sense of my career walk, walking through and, and operating through government uh, until my retirement in 2016, where I retired and then went to work for a consulting firm in the Washington, D.C. metro area, and then, to start, to start, and then decided to start my own company in July of 2019. So I wanna share a, a little bit about where I come from because oftentimes, in my opinion, it is very important to have a sense of where people come from so they have a sense of where you can go. Uh, and primarily that is, I want to show you that I came from humble beginnings, if you will. Uh, these pictures, uh, I'll start with the center picture. I was raised, on my family's 100 acre tobacco farm in, in Southern Virginia, okay? So I came from the farm, okay? And so then you, let's, let's look at the far left picture. That is me on kindergarten day, okay? Riding the bus on kindergarten day. And I distinctly remember my cousins giving me grief about that day because all of my cousins that had to go to school before then this was the first year that the bus came to the came down the road to the bus stop that had a bus stop near the house where my grandparents lived okay everyone else had to walk up the road which might have been you know a uh, hundred yards or maybe 200 yards but this was the first year um so it was it was prepared for me uh, to the far right, it's just a picture of me when I was in the Navy, understanding from, from a standpoint of uh, there were no silver spoons, okay? Now, I did, I did have a spoon, so I want to make sure that I am very clear that I lived a very solid um, middle-class lifestyle, okay? My parents did everything they could 
to, to set my brother and I up for success. Uh, but, okay, there was no trust fund. We weren't trust fund babies. So therefore we had to figure it out to some degree as we became adults on our own. What I wanna share with you is that success is absolutely attainable from a standpoint of coming from humble beginnings, uh, success is absolutely attainable. Where you start has absolutely no bearing on where you can finish. The question really is, are you, really, are you ready to take the baton? Okay, are you ready to take the baton? I love the symbolism of relay races as it applies to our community specifically talking to an HBCU community, I am really interested in making sure that the next generation understands the relay race that our community has run. So we're in the fourth leg of the relay. This is the anchor leg, in my opinion. The first leg was about freedom. The second leg was about segregation, overcoming segregation. The third leg was about equality and civil rights. And now we're in the fourth leg of the race. And in my opinion, that is economic empowerment. Okay, how do we set our families up for success? Depending on no matter how you decide to, to describe family, we're in the fourth leg of the race. This is economic empowerment. May no, make, make no mistake about it. So my question is simply, have you ever thought about government contracting, often called B2G, business to government, okay, selling business to government, have you ever thought about government contracting as a strategy to grow, develop, create jobs, create businesses, and to move forward in an economic fashion, okay? I wanna talk about four things. I want to talk about four things today. I'm going to frame our conversation in, in four ways. There's going to be a lot of information that's going to be happening in 40 minutes, but I want to frame it in about four ways. Okay, we're going to talk about mindset, what the opportunity is, what the launch plan could be, what could look like, okay, one of the things that I, I coach and teach, and then give you a little proof. Nothing, nothing beats a little economic proof. Okay, so the mindset, here's the mindset. Government contracting can be for you, okay? Don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but successful business and job creation, along with generational wealth, are all within reach through government contracting. One of the things in our community we have to think about is how do we pass assets along to the next generation, okay? How do we do that? And as, and as a result of government contracting, you can not only create jobs today, but hand the keys over to the next generation when you're done. When you've run your leg of the race and you're ready for the next one, there's no headhunting required. There's no job search required. If that individual has been exposed to the business and is competent and interested in taking the reins of the family business to the next generation, it is all within reach. You just hand the keys over because they have the right last name. Now, one of the things when I was growing up, okay, one of the things while I had exposure to a lot of different things, Government contracting was not one of them. I didn't have any visions or, or, you know, of what or symbols of what government contracting could look like. But here are four, okay? You, you pick the arena, everything from construction to janitorial to IT to cybersecurity to training, development, coaching, okay? building ships, building planes, building materials, medicine. You pick the arena and the government has good, has the needs for goods and services. So what I wanna do is make sure for those that are interested, you have a vision of what it could look like. And we're gonna dive a little bit more into that as well, okay? Now the difference between the big guys and the little guys and the people that haven't thought about working in this space and, and those that have, 
There's only three pieces of information. There's only three things that distinguish from, from those that have gone down this path for those that have not. It is information. And we're going to work a little bit on that today. It's effort. You have to answer that question. And it's opportunity. Okay. Now, a lot of times people think about opportunities as something that is given. Sometimes they are. But in most instances, I believe opportunities are created. Okay. So if you're interested and you get the information and you're willing to do the effort and you're willing to create your opportunities, government contracting can be for you. So let's get a little mindset food. These are the top 20 federal government contractors in the country. This was 2019 data. So this is contracting data from last year. Okay. And I'm sure at the top of this list are names we've all heard before. The Lockheed Martins, Boeings, General Dynamics, Raytheons, Northrop Grumman's of the world. Okay. And when you look at those dollars, make sure you look at those dollars because again, those dollars are in millions. Okay. So that's $48 billion that Lockheed Martin booked last year. Okay. And the 20th on the, on the list booked $3 billion worth of work. Okay. These are the top 20. Little mindset food. And to think about each one of these 20, each one of these 20 started with one person or a small hand, you know, a, a couple of people idea. It was an idea of a couple of people. Each one of them started somewhere. They didn't just come out the crib being Lockheed Martin. And it didn't just come out of the crib being Humana or Honeywell or BAE. Okay. At some point, I always like to talk about, I always like to say the number 15, Booz, Allen, and Hamilton. At some point, it was just Booz, Allen, and Hamilton. Okay. But with information, effort, and opportunity, this is what the results can be. So can you envision yourself as a government contractor? Maybe, maybe not, okay? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna help a little bit with that, okay? Let's talk next about the opportunity, okay? Now I wanna niche this down a little bit just to make sure that we are, that, that people can see this from a standpoint of, ah, this is relevant to me. So this is Virginia, our state, this year now today is the 23rd of september so there's only seven more days in the fiscal year okay but this fiscal year virginia statewide 102 billion with a b dollars were spent at the federal level alone okay so we're not even talking about state we're not even talking about local this is at the federal level. $102 billion were spent in the state. Let's niche it down even further because I want to bring, I want to bring this thing home. In the seven cities, okay, the seven, otherwise known as the 757, $9.4 billion were spent to date in the seven cities at the federal level. So we're not talking about at the state level, and we're not talking about each of the seven cities that have their own procurement machines and needs to support those cities. Just at the federal level, $9.4 billion were spent. Now, here are the top 20 agencies in the seven cities. So I, I mined the data to say these are the organizations. Now this this isn't surprising, okay? When you think about Department of Defense, that you've got Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marines top rolled into number one. But the lion's share of the work happens because we know in the seven cities, we're a military area, okay? So, but, so the lion's share of it happens in the Department of Defense. But look at the other 19, okay? These are heavy hitters. Again, $9.4 billion were spent in the area, in the seven cities. This is work done in the seven cities. 
not like the paperwork was done here. The activity was done in the seven cities. Here are the top 20. I want to keep giving you some mindset food. Okay. Let's niche it down even further. What I want to talk about is small business federal contracting. Here are the FY 2020 goals. Okay. So of those dollars at the highest level, literally trillions of dollars that are spent in the federal budget, 23% of them, the goals of the federal government say, shall, that shall be spent with small businesses. Okay, so you think about that context. Almost a quarter of the, of the dollars, the goals of the federal government are, they shall be spent with small businesses. And then there are other various categories that have goals as well. Small disadvantaged businesses, 5%. Women owns, 5%. Hub zones, hub zones are, are companies that are headquartered and employ people in historically underutilized business zones, hub zones. They have a 3% goal as well. And then service disabled veteran owned small businesses. They have a goal as well. So these are categories that the federal government has said. So let me, let me take that back. These are categories that the country has said and that is manifested through the goals of the Small Business Administration that said these are important to the country, okay? And as a result of that, these goals are given to federal agencies. Those top 20 agencies is given to all of them, but those top 20 absolutely have goals that they are responsible for. So let's, let's look at the report card a little bit. In fiscal year 19, so this ended, ended last September, okay, September 30th of 2019, the federal government exceeded its small business subcontracting goal. You saw the first subcontracting goal for 19 was 23. It exceeded it. 26% went to small businesses. That 26% that resulted in $132 billion worth of prime contracts that went to small businesses. As they say, the highest amount ever on the scorecard's history. 132 billion. Okay. So here's the scorecard, but let's talk about the report card. The 2019 goals, first column. Here's the report card. Service disabled small businesses, Veteran-owned small businesses had a 3% goal, but they only met 1.95%. Small disadvantaged businesses have a 5% goal, okay? And that's eco historically economic, or historically economically disadvantaged businesses, 5% okay? goal, only 4.17%. Women been knocking it out of the park, okay? They exceeded their goal last year, okay? Hub zones though, which has historically been the hardest to meet, okay? In my 26 years on the other side of the table working in federal procurement on the government side, this was always the hardest to meet. But surprisingly, we have tons of hub zones in the seven cities. Only 1.37%. And if you go over one column more, look at what the changes are for those categories that were missed from 18. They actually went down. What that says to me is opportunity. Opportunity. Those are the increases and decreases from 18. So they not only missed, but went down in some of the categories. I would argue those are target-rich opportunities. So let's talk about a launch pad. If this was something for you, let's talk about what the launch pad looks like. Okay. Here is a broad generalization of the contracting process. Okay. Six broad pieces. The government has needs. They need to buy things. They issue RFPs and RFQs, requests for proposals and requests for quotes. How much will you sell this to us for? We need X. How much will you charge us to deliver it? 
contractors do the bidding, they do some level of source selection, identifying winners amongst those contractors that are bidding. Work is awarded and performed. Okay, that's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, and then contracts are closed out and they start the process all over again. What does the launch pad for that type of activity look like? This is a framework, and I'll go through it really quickly. Uh, but there is an opportunity for anyone that's interested to reach out and let's talk about it. You got to be a business. And number one, though, you got to be a business. This is real. Okay, this is this is absolutely real. Okay. You got to have a business. You have to have your entity, your your DUNS numbers, your registrations, all of that activity that needs to happen. Business bank account, all of those things. It's got to be real. It's really, really real. This isn't a this isn't a cash app business. This is real, okay? Paperwork and processes. You got to make sure you get all the paperwork done, okay? You plan with the federal government, and it's a great opportunity, but there are rules and regulations and paperwork and processes that need to occur. That work needs to happen. You need to find your tribe. Number three, where are the people that would buy the goods and services you're interested in providing? Right? Got to find those where those people reside, and there's some strategies, tactics, and tools to do that. Number four, you have to demonstrate your value proposition from a standpoint of what am I good at, and what do I have a competitive advantage at delivering value. Okay. Now, one of the things about delivering value, sometimes people think that the individual has to be the subject matter expert. No, the individual just has to run the business. Now it's great if they have subject matter expertise, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Okay? Now, the goal is to hire the best brains you can find. Okay? And then you can, individual can run the business. Start small, number five. Don't be afraid to start small. My very first contract was $4,800. It was a speaking engagement for $4,800. But that was the first, that was the first foray into federal, into federal government contracting. Don't be fearful of starting small. A lot of people are running after the million dollar contract. Surprising that no one's running, is not a lot of people running after the $4,800. Okay. So the goal is just to keep stacking those. Those will lead to other things and those will lead to other one will lead to another, and one will lead to another. But don't fear starting small. Number six, team, team, team. When we talked about those government contractors, that top 20, guess what? They don't do all the work that they have been contracted for. They have team members that help them, okay? And some people and some companies make great strides and, and have long-standing leveraged execution working as subcontractors for their entire career. They never have a prime contractor, but it is a great business model if that's what you still choose to do. Number seven, something I call hunt, fish, and farm for opportunities. Hunting is just standing here and waiting for things to cross your path, and then you try to take them out. That's great. It's a strategy, in my opinion, not an optimum one, but it's a great strategy. It's a good strategy. Fishing is a little better strategy, and I think it's probably something that's much more familiar in the 757. We are a water community. Okay. You put a lot of water, you put a lot of lines in the water. Okay. And that you hope through teaming, through multiple streams of content and engagement that you hope that something comes by and bites one of your hooks. Farming is really the optimum, that you plant the seeds. It's a longer term dynamic. It's relationship based, but you become part of the community that needs your goods and services. And you plant the seeds today that you expect to harvest months and years from now. It's a way of identifying opportunities. Number eight, know the voice of your customer. Really, really important. 
from a standpoint of what are their needs? What's the language that they speak? Cybersecurity professionals talk a lot different than medical professionals. If you're gonna live in the medical professional community or you're gonna live in that universe, you gotta know that language, okay? You gotta know the difference between a microscope and a stethoscope, okay? So that knowing the voice of your customer, how they operate, what their needs are, what their missions are, very, very important to government contracting success. Number nine, this is a strategy that I call identifying the need. Some people, some entities want vitamins, okay? And vitamins, in my opinion, are aspirational. They aren't really necessary. We hope that there is value in taking vitamins, that we are looking to go to a better place. It's aspirational. We hope to get better by taking vitamins. When it's Tylenol time, that means that there's pain. Many businesses, and especially small businesses, tend to get in the business of providing vitamins. Vitamins are discretionary. You could take them or you could not. When you sell Tylenol and you find people with pain, they are clamoring for your goods and services. So a strategy that's very, very important is to be a provider of Tylenol. Figure out for your community what fixes their pains. And if you can figure that out, they will come finding for you, they will come looking for you. That sales is just a matter of letting people know you have the best Tylenol, okay? They'll find you. Tylenol over vitamins. And then the last is a strategy. Um, I am not the creator of this strategy, but I feel like I've done a pretty good job of maximizing it in terms of building a go-to-market strategy that is based on a free, free content, free value to feed model, where then someone is actually paying you. Giving some content out for free, making yourself known in the space, making yourself known as a provider of goods and services, okay. and then stepping people from or customers from the free item to the fee item. Here's an example. Williams Whiteboard is a creation of mine that I started when the pandemic when the lockdown of the pandemic actually started 28, 29 weeks ago. It is free content. It's a YouTube channel. And every week, I pick a topic, something that's either happening in my business, in my coaching business, or in my government contracting business, and I talk about it. I frame it out, put some thought about it, and try to provide value in 10 minutes or less. Every week, consistency on message and then demonstrating a level of competence and expertise in the space. From the 10-minute version, I get a lot of people that reach out and say, wow, that was an awesome 10 minutes. Could you do a one-hour lunch and learn for us? Of course I could. Let's stroke the check. From the one hour lunch and learn to the half day training session, could you take that content or some other content, uh, some other content and do a half day? Absolutely I could, okay? The half day turns into the one day, the one day turns into the three day, and just yesterday I signed a contract for a one year training contract, okay? It all started with a 10 minute free video. Okay, you have to master the concept, in my opinion, as a small, niche, focused business to figure out the strategy of moving from free content 
to feed content. Okay. It's a strategy. So folks, we're on the downward slide of the content because I want to make sure that we have some time for some question and answer period. But I want to talk about a framing that I think for business that can be effective for you. Passion controls our language. The things we're passionate about are the things that we talk about. Our language controls our discussions. The things we talk about, okay, and the language that we use affect the things that we actually talk about. Discussions control our relationships, okay? The things we talk about foster the relationships that we create, okay? And then lastly, our relationships control our business. Even though in the government contracting space at the federal, at the state, and the local, there are rules and regulations and processes that are designed to have a fair, balanced, and equitable contracting process, procurement process. In the end, people do business with people they like, people they know, and people they trust. Okay. So even within the machinery, if this is something that you're thinking about embarking on, you have to think about the concept of being able to build relationships in business because in the end what people do business with people they like people they know and people they trust okay so let's talk about a little proof the proof is always in the pudding okay so my business think acquisition it was founded in july of 2019 that first year revenue for that contract, for that, for that business, at the end, our, my tax return said $45,000 and some change. That was year one, which was about five months long. Okay, five months long. Here's what year two looks like to date. Okay, to date, I've crossed over, or the business has crossed over, $534,000 worth of revenue. It's real. It's possible. Okay. That's the proof. And my goal for next year is going to be a seven, seven figure year. That's the expectation for next year, a seven figure year. Okay. So everybody starts somewhere. Even Booz Allen and Hamilton started as Booz Allen and Hamilton. Okay. And someone started with a $45,000 revenue year. Okay. But again, with the information, with the knowledge, and created opportunities, this is an opportunity to build something great that not only can leverage my time, my energy, my capability but I have the ability to hand the keys over to the next generation. Here's what my current, mo current model looks like, my current business model. There are some government contracts, there's some training development work, there's actually government consulting work that occurs. Okay. There's some individual coaching that I do, as well as government contracting, business consulting and coaching to other small businesses. Incubating, growing, scaling small businesses in the government contracting space. And then once they are awarded and they win work, helping them with their post award contract administration and business development. After you've won a contract or after you've done a piece of work or after you've, you've figured out a, a way to be a partner or a subcontractor, now what do we do? How do we execute? And I've got a couple of few little projects that I'm working on the side, working on an app, and also my Williams Whiteboard YouTube channel. Okay. Those, this is a business model. I'm not suggesting this for everyone, but this one is mine. So, are you wondering if you can do it or not? In my opinion, the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely, yes. Okay. 
It may seem like a puzzle, okay? From a standpoint of, oh, there's a lot of stuff to do. Yes, there is. Oh, it's not as easy as I thought. No, it isn't. Oh, it's kind of hard finding contracts. Yes, it is. Okay. But it's figure outable. Okay. If that's actually a word. It's figure outable. I am a big believer that if any human on the planet has done it before, it can be replicated. The only difference between them and me or them and you is information, effort, and opportunity. It's a figure, figure outable puzzle. Okay. You can do it. It's capable of being done. Now, here's the motivation for me, and I'm hoping it lands well with you. The question is really, which of your buckets is bigger? It's a simple mindset game, but it's powerful. When you find those instances where it's, oh, I got to go get a Dunn's number. Yes. Oh, I got to sign up for this. I got to sign up on this website. Yes. Oh, I've got to go get a business bank account. Yes. Oh, I've got to go get an LLC. Yes. Oh, I've got to do marketing and sales. Yes. But which bucket is bigger? Is your dream bucket the same size or larger than your obstacle bucket? My strategy is always to make sure my dream bucket, that I put enough stuff in my dream bucket to overcome any obstacle I may have. And there are obstacles. I remember when I went from one employee, me, sole proprietorship, to two employees. I had to figure out how to do payroll. Payroll, okay. Which bucket is bigger? Dream bucket, obstacle bucket. Okay, dream bucket bigger. Figure it out, okay. Taxes, oh my gracious, taxes are coming. Soon as I realized, oh, Uncle Sam's gonna want his piece. Okay, got to figure out the taxes. One strategy says, oh, never mind, stop. I'll just become an employee again and do my turbo tax at the end of the year. Dream bucket, bigger than obstacle bucket. Yep, dream bucket bigger. There's some stuff in that dream bucket I really want, like building something for my children that I can hand them off, that I can give them the keys just because they got the right last name. Which is bigger for you? As you process this or other business opportunities, you really have to think about, is your dream bucket bigger, larger, more grandiose, more shiny, more glitzy than your obstacle bucket? Everybody has an obstacle bucket. And oftentimes it's chock full of stuff. The bigger you grow, the bigger obstacles you have. Just this, just this week, I'm dealing with a tax strategist now. I've never had a tax strategist before. I just buy my TurboTax from Sam's at the end of the year and go do my taxes. This year, I need a tax strategist. I could just bury my head in the sand and say, oh, don't worry about it. But the dream bucket is bigger than the obstacle. And I am not one that is fearful of paying taxes. I just want to pay my fair share. Because paying taxes, and this isn't a political statement, but paying taxes is a sign that you've made some money. That you've made some money. Okay, so please, we're at minute 39, great timing. I am a big fan of government contracting. I'd love for you to connect on LinkedIn with me if there's an opportunity for me to help, give you more information. Here's my information. You will see my presence on LinkedIn. Please connect, let's connect. If you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn. Okay. That's where business is happening today and will likely be even more in the future. 
So let's talk a, bit, a little bit. Now that we've gotten the presentation of content out of the way, uh, I would love to open up for a little Q&A time. I would welcome a conversation in how I may assist in any fashion in sharing, talking about, thinking about any questions you may have. I uh, would like to start if I could. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hi. Good, good hey, morning. Good morning. Thank you for a really, really terrific uh, synopsis of a way to uh, build our businesses through government contract. That was pretty excellent. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I am Henry Stevens, and I am the CEO of Precise Portions. And um, unfortunately, our business is around... Um, diabetes management and portion control and nutrition, um, nutrition learning systems. But I think for many people, they see us as vitamins, not really Tylenol. So <laughs> I wanted your guidance. I mean, we've, we've thought a lot about um, government contracts. In fact, we um, very poorly transitioned uh, some production from China to the US thinking that that would be a way to um, allow us to be eligible for GSA contracts. Um, yes. But again, we're in the vitamin business and so there actually aren't requests for the things that we sell. We would have to, A, to your point, find our tribe. We have not done that very well. And then B, we have not really figured out how to uh, do that value proposition so that we're communicating the Tylenol component uh, you know, even though we, we do know that, um, that there's a very high incidence of uh, type 2 diabetes, there are lots of people failing their PT exams uh, due to weight management, et cetera. Sure. So we know there's a need. We just haven't really figured out how to do that Rubik's Cube, which I really loved, um, and put it together in a way that's compelling. And um, I mean, we would be happy with free to fee but we haven't even figured out how to get to free. So <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so how would you think about that? So my, my comment is, you, you actually just talked about a couple of those things. That is, you have to go find your tribe. Oftentimes, uh, I have seen government contractors, small, small government contractors, or small businesses that are interested in finding the government of finding work in the government contracting space, think that they can just put a shingle out or a blinking neon sign and the masses will come to them, okay? That may happen once in a lifetime, but most often you have to go find the individuals that whatever the good and service you have is a pain for them, is that your good and solution is a solution that alleviates a pain that they have. So while the individual that's failing the PT test, you would think that's a pain for them. <laughs> okay. However, the subject matter expert that runs the PT program or the doctor that's on staff or the nutritionist that's on staff that has failing PT participants, they have pain. Uh, I need something to help me get these, individual, these individuals across the finish line. Now, again, you would think the person that's not getting across the finish line <laughs> would, would have enough pain, but it's hard to find them. Yeah. But nutritionists, think about state and locals that are working on local health, health departments. They have goals and they get funding and grant funding to increase the health of the participants in the state and local environment, they have pain. To keep the grant money going, they need solutions. You have to go find them. And as soon as you can get in that community, find that community, become a part of that community, and then let them know you sell Tylenol, if they have real pain, the sales cycle becomes really, really easy. 
Okay, great. I mean, you know, we thought we could do that with the VA hospitals, but we always get this kind of a budget, you know, pushback, right? It's like, or, you know, um, somebody might say like at the Pentagon, they kind of said, well, you know, the guy at um, the Walter Reed is in charge of this. You know, there's always this like, you know, moving parts. It's, it's, yes. it's been really unwieldy. It, it, it is absolutely moving parts, but I, here's what I'll say is you just keep hitting away at it. I, I had a client this morning, I was on a call this morning and my advice to them was, it's like, oh, you know, it's so many, it's so many pieces, so many places we can talk to and we talk to this person and we talk to this person and, I, and the analogy that I used for them was imagine yourself going into a mature forest with an ax uh. and you just take one swing at every tree, okay? You, 50 trees out there and you just swing, you give your best swing, but you only swing once at one tree. You have to identify the tree you want to fall and put every swing on that tree. Hmm. Okay? Time and time again. So with, if that's a communique, that's an email, that's a request for a meeting, that's a, a, a request for information, that's a source of, source of salt, not, um, a source of salt event, that is being a part of the community that's going to the Zoom call for the, you know, the nutritionists. The nutritionists live somewhere online. The doctors of nutrition live somewhere online. The PT people, the people that are responsible for successful um, physical education for military, they live somewhere. You have to go find their tent, get in the tent with them, and then have conversations about the community. I think you'll be surprised at what the needs are and who knows their needs, their pains might have directly aligned to the title at all that you're selling. Okay, terrific. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Um, hi there. I'll try to go next if I can. Please. All right. My name is Deborah Gleason. I am the information chamber, hence the cute little avatar. Um, she is all about um, just data analytics, processes, all that fun stuff. Anyway, yes. my question is, um, I'm actually LLC'd under a different name because I rebranded. Okay. Is that, a, is that a problem? Should I re-LLC under the new brand or am I okay because I already have another, it's DKG Analytics and it's an LLC. I already have a business account and a couple other things. Yes. And kind of partnered with that is there a list of everything you need to have before you can start pursuing a government contract uh, so two fair in my opinion two fairly easy quest questions um, or the, at least the answers are, are, are pretty easy uh, for the second one the answer is yes you can find that information your local PTAC PTAC procurement technical advisory center okay there, there's one in the seven in the, in the seven cities. So you, if you just look up PTAC, you'll be able to find that. Um, and then if you can't, reach out to me. I'll be able to I'll be able to point you in the right direction as well. In Great. terms of branding, I believe whatever you do, you want to diminish confusion. Okay. No matter what the answer is. So if 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 your branding is not confusing, okay, great. But if there's ever an instance of confusing, where of confusion, where someone looks at this and doesn't recognize that that's you, you want to fix that. Okay? When I started out, I started out as William Randolph before I had a company name. Okay, but as soon as I had a company name, because I was doing business in my name, William Randolph, William C. Randolph, I was doing business as my, and that was my company. I was a sole proprietor. As soon as humanly possible, after I decided, it's like, okay, this thing is bigger than just a name. I need to have a company because now I'm branching out of just some of some other activities. I immediately went into the um, the the what is called the SAM system and redid all of my branding. Now all of my branding is think acquisition, everything. Okay. Now mo a lot of people know that I'm behind it. Okay, because I'm the I, I am the face of the brand. But all of my activity happens under the guise of 
William Randolph. So, I mean, under the guise of think acquisition. So I think the answer is, if you're going to be serious and you're going to be taken serious and you think about who you're going to be five years from now, do the work today. Okay. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Hi, Don. I have a question. Um, I can't cut the camera on, but sure. so you guys can hear me pretty good. Yes. My name is Janice and I have a small construction company. And I heard you talk about um, contractual, uh, obtaining contracts and how that can be challenging. Yes. And I know this to be true because one of my services consists of contractual procurement. So I was wondering um, if you have any suggestions for like an easier way to go about that. Like, do you, do you hire somebody such as like Big Connect or platforms like them to help you search? Or do you yourself have a way that you go about securing government contracts? So uh, two answers to that. If the value and your community suggests that there needs, you need to have a service to do that for you, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking those services. I'm suggest, my, my only suggestion is I would use my relationships. I am a much more of a relationships-based search, if you will, than, in, than any other strategy. The, there's a company called Deltec. There's a company called GovWin. There's a FedBid. There are, mm -hmm. there, are, there are a lot of companies out there that will claim they right. can go and give you, right. give you access, give you a vision of what's happening. I'm suggesting in beta.sam.gov, which is the new website, beta, B-E-T-A dot Sam, S-A-M dot gov. Okay, that's the website where all the contracting activity occurs. You can mine that data. It's capable of being done yourself. And on some level, I think there's some value in at least learning how to do that so that if you decide to go and buy it from someone, they can't blow smoke up your butt, you know, in terms of uh, from a pricing perspective. It's like, right, 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 right. Okay, I, I just did this. I, I need someone to do it more faster, more effectively while I go and do this. I need this running in the background, but that shouldn't cost 20 grand. Right, because what I've noticed is that one of the things that I, you know, yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, they have the information, but they're not up to date. They're not all up to date. Like, yeah. that's horrible. That doesn't help. Agreed. Agreed. So, yes, there are, there are a couple of ways to mine that data. Um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the data you'll see, you saw in my presentation was from uh, usaspending.gov. Okay, so that's after the fact. After the dollars have been spent, it will not only tell you what organization contracted for the dollars, I mean, the, the, the department or agency that purchased the item, it'll also tell you who the services, who they purchased them from. Okay, so you can see who's in your space. All right, all right. Beta.sam.gov beta mm -hmm. does all of the prospective stuff, things that are coming out, and right. then contract awards. So if you're watching something, and then and once it's all going to the process of selection and, and select contractor selection, then it'll also say, and this company was awarded. Okay. Right. I, just this week, I had two companies reach out to me that saw that my contract that was awarded yesterday, uh, they, they saw the preliminary actions, and then they, they say, this, war, this contract was awarded to Think Acquisition. I had two companies reach out and say, hey, would you be interested in partnering and doing business with us? Oh, yeah, I love that question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's the way it works. It's relationships. Right. Now, un unfortunately for this instance, the answer is no, but I'm connecting mm -hmm. with the people because I don't know what tomorrow may bring. Right. Um, so, imagine so, if something uh, lands tomorrow. It's like, ooh, this is too big for me. But wait a minute. I just had two companies reach out that do the exact same thing I do. We can get together and we can, co mm -hmm. we can go to the marketplace as a larger entity, a joint venture, a partnership, a prime sub relationship, and we can, we can show up bigger than what we really are individually. Right, right. It's about the relationships. Right. So, so, so in that case, that's, the, that's basically the angle you want to use if you're trying to get, do business in your local community. Because, right, it's a lot of... Um, a lot going on in the local community and I'm trying to bridge a gap between the work and the people who know how to do the work. 
So in the local community, I, it's best to go with the angle of relationships then, not so yeah. much. Yeah, it's power. Yeah, I think the relationships work. Now, I, I don't suggest that that, that that strategy be your only strategy. Right. That's, a, that's a fishing strategy. You just put lines in the water and hopefully something comes through. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm, I love the farming model that says, I'm going to go plant the seeds where I want, where I want to harvest crop from. Okay. Okay. And I, and I okay. came from a farm, so I okay. understand that model really, really, really. I mean, well. I understand it. I understand the. Yeah. So here's here's a prime example for you: the HRBT that's going to be redone. Uh -huh. I just read in the paper yesterday on, online that they've gotten the, they've received the green light to go ahead. Now, most people that's there's a three billion dollar project. Yeah. Okay. Now, most people look at that and say, "Oh, I don't, I don't do." underwater tunnels, so I can't play with the HRBT. I went to the call where they were looking for, for the call for vendors. They were they had calls for trucks, shipping. Um, they had caterers. Okay, think about that. People that mm -hmm. have, to, have, sell, have to deliver food to the job site. They built, they outfitted a new office, so they needed an interior designer to come do the office. They needed office. They needed office um, products. They needed office equipment, desks, chairs. All of those are HRBT related. Okay. So when you think about big projects, you know, I saw another project that the USS Boise, that that Huntington Ingalls in Newport News just got awarded a three hundred and forty million dollar contract to do some additional work on the USS USS Boise, which is a submarine. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a nuclear reactor in my backyard to help them do work on the nuclear sub. But who knows what the ancillary services are that they may need? You have to play a larger game and from, term, from a standpoint of hunting, fishing, and farming for opportunities. Plant the seeds. Talk to the small business rep okay, at, at whatever project that's going on. Find the information and then find the niche where you can be top of mind and have a competitive advantage to deliver value. This was like the best advice ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to stop right here. Oh. So I work with uh, Lovett Consulting Agency, uh, which you just spoke to her. So um, I deal more in the, the about eight years of human resource ex experience, uh, Lane Six Sigma logistics, and and my question is more HR related. We have certain skill sets in project management and certain skill sets uh, in architectural drafting and things that we can do ourselves. Yes. But then, like you were saying, there's other work uh, when we want to bid for government contracts. We need certain you know, skill sets, uh, the different type of construction companies that we're going to have to outsource to do joint bid agreements with. But what I found was a lot of bids locally, federally, they always want to see that you have already done this work. They want to see uh, a history of it being done. Um, you can easily get with a company that has done the work and do a joint bid agreement with them. Uh, but just like hiring a person, it's always a risky business. Hiring another business can also be risky as well because they are representing your company as a sub or, or we're representing each other. And based on how they do, uh, sets the presence of your company. What is your best advice on choosing a good subcontractor for the work uh, that you need to do um, when, you're, when you're trying to really get yourself out there, and, and I want to add one small caveat to that. Um, we do have a desire uh, to, to focus a little bit more my, minority-owned um, uh, small, small companies that have not had the opportunity to get into some of these uh, bids, but they, but they have the experience and skills. So that's okay. my question. Okay, so uh, three, three things, three questions, three answers. The first is cast the broadest net you can. Okay, from a standpoint of join the communities. I'm a big community and relationships person. Join the community where your people live. 
okay? And find those subject matter expert, experts, that's number one. Number two, you're absolutely correct. Just every contract, every contracting activity and every contracting request has to proposal, has to consider past performance, okay? So it's, it's just a part, it's a part of the business. No one, you know, you wouldn't even do this at home. You know, would you invite, would you invite someone to come and work on you? You've got something going on with your plumbing. Something's going on with your toilet and a guy and, and somebody drives up in a Corvette and it's got a couple of, you know, got, it's got a hammer in one hand and a pipe wrench in the other. And it's like, I'm here to fix the toilet. And it's like, wait a minute. That, you don't look like you can solve the problem. Okay. And then the person comes up with the truck, the van, you know, with the with the with the uh, with the ladders on top, and they've got the signage on the side, and said, "We've done this. Here are our resume, and here are some here's our here's some people that we've done the service for, and here are our references." We kind of go with the person that's kind of looked like they've done it before. Okay, it looks there's absolutely no difference. It's even more so in the federal government space. There's always a risk component when working for the federal government because you're spending taxpayer dollars. And as a result of that, you have to be very, I, I lived 26 years on that, side of the, um, on, on that side of the fence. You have to be very diligent about how you spend taxpayer dollars because you can e easily find yourself in the Washington Post or the Daily, or the, or the Pilot or the Daily Press, you know, fleecing America on 60 Minutes. The fleecing of America, okay? So it's very, very important. That's number two. It's like, yes, past performance plays. So go where you can, where you have past performance. If you don't have it yourself, go get it as a sub, okay? It might take you a little time. Go do a couple of sub deals. Now you now you show up with past performance being ready for the, um, being ready for the next, you know, kind of the next opportunity. In terms of casting a broader net, net for, um, for individuals of our community, great. Con I congratulate you. Okay, and, and and that's all. That's all I have to say with that. I, I the beauty of having your own business is you can hire how you choose. Okay, you can't break the federal laws. Okay, but you can recruit and hire how you choose, how you so choose. Okay, I do. Okay. And therefore, um, you can focus on whatever you want to focus on. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So I, I applaud the activity. Oh, thank you, sir. So Ms. Richardson, I know we are at time and probably past time. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity. And please, folks, here's my last bit of information. If uh, again, all, here's all my information on LinkedIn. This is my email address and telephone number. Um, and please reach out. Um, I do these types of um, speaking opportunities and Zooms. Um, I, I post them on LinkedIn. So you'll see advertisements and opportunities uh, or, or um, events posted on LinkedIn. So. If this, is a, if this is a career field or a business field that interests you, let's connect. Let's talk about it and see how I can help. I have a uh, handful of clients that I, use, that, I, that I help incubate, grow, and scale their businesses. And I would be honored to help you do the same. Thank you all so very much.